Father, thank you for the time and uh, place where we can come and worship you this evening, uh, Lord's Day. God, I ask that you uh, open the eyes of the, of the open the eyes of the hearts of the people who are here this evening, the ears of their hearts, so that it may they may see and hear the glories that are preached in uh, Acts one six through eleven. God, will you use your word to transform our hearts, our minds, our conversations, uh, how we live before you and one another for your name's sake? God, will you use your word um, to mature us in godliness? To you be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Um, if you don't have your Bibles already in Acts, please turn your Bible to the book of Acts, chapter 1. Um I have a story. Uh, I was dating this girl who was going to become my wife. And um, there's a lot of um, wisdom I sought from different men who are godly. And one of the men said to me, Murphy, you need to know where you're going. She's going to follow you. You have to know where you're going. And in light of Pastor John Zabo's sermon last week, Pastor John asked us a question from the text that's valid, which is, where did we come from? He gave us our heritage in the Christian faith. And I want to continue that same uh, stream of thought in a question that I have for us to ask and answer this evening. Where are we going? Right? Where is the church, go the early church going, and where are we going 2,000 years later? Um, so, as we read in verse 6, um, it says, So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? The disciples asked Jesus, Lord, at this time will you restore the kingdom of Israel? Realizing after Jesus' resurrection and the promise of the Holy Spirit, the reign of the Messiah had come and the final salvation for Israel was to happen. The disciples are probably thinking that Jesus, thinking of Jesus restoring Israel's military power and or even their political power, resulting in the Roman armies retreating back to Rome because Rome was the force in um in the time of Acts, in, in Jerusalem, Rome ruled. Um, the disciples' idea of restoring the kingdom of Israel is earthly-minded because they want it flesh and bone. We want power. We want the political sway to live the life that God has commanded us to do so. We want the, the armies to back it up. And Jesus reminds his disciples, it's not for you to know the times and seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority. Um, I haven't said this, but I'm going to say it now so I don't forget. This is a Trinitarian passage. We have both the Father, who is affixing his own times and authority when he's going to restore Israel. We have the Son, who is speaking and who will see ascend. And we have the power of the Holy Spirit in this text. Um, continuing, God the Father is in control. There is no need to worry about the restoration of the kingdom of Israel. Jesus continues, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses in all of Judea, I'm sorry, in all of Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Jesus corrects his disciples' question by letting them know that the restoration of Israel will not come in the power of Israel's military nor their political power, but in the power of the Holy Spirit, with the disciples being a witness of Christ to Israel. As Jesus says, I command you to, or Jesus says, you will be my witnesses, that is a command, in all of Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the end of this age. Jesus teaches his disciples that they will see power of the Holy Spirit comes upon them, giving them the ability to preach the gospel effectively 
and doing miracles in accordance with the gospel proclamation. As we have seen in the gospel accounts, we've seen Jesus do this. Jesus preaches, and then he does a miracle. And we're going to see that in Acts played out as well. This is the means by which God is restoring God's people in Israel, and is, it is the means by which God restores his pe- people today. I know some uh, may be thinking, Murphy, this is a Baptist church it, that is reformed in their theology, theology. So yes, to effective gospel preaching through the power of the Holy Spirit, but you're going off the rails a little with the miracle talk in accordance with effective gospel preaching. Murphy, don't you know miracles? That's what the Charismatics do? Bethel? Lifehouse? Hillsong? Um, I have some biblical examples and some real life examples. Um, Some biblical examples, the, the original word for miracle in Acts is talked about seven times here in throughout the book of Acts, where it's uh, effective gospel proclamation connected with mir- miracles. And I won't read all of them for the sake of time. Um, uh, a couple of them I will read. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that, excuse me, that God did through him and in your midst, as you yourselves know. Acts 3.12. When Peter saw it, he addressed the people, men of Israel, why do you wonder at this? And why do you stare at us as though by our own power or piety we have made the lame man walk? So those are just a couple uh, biblical examples. Now let's give a couple real life examples. And I know the hair on your back or your neck must be standing. What do you mean real life examples of a miracle of the power of the Holy Spirit? So let me give one. Several. A real life example of effective gospel preaching with miracles in accordance with the gospel message. Uh, Church family, uh, question it's uh rhetorical you don't have to answer this but how many times have you come to corporate worship and you're brokenhearted contrite in spirit over a particular situation in your life or you had a rough morning with the family before showing up men you didn't love your wife like christ loves the church women you didn't respect your husband as god commands you to do or maybe you just fell into a pet sin that you promised the Lord that you were going to get out of. We still show up to corporate worship uh, seeking to obey God, and God acts the miracle in our hearts, in the minds, through the power of the Holy Spirit, uh, through the means of effective expository preaching, uh, resulting in victory over sin, uh, giving us the men giving you the ability to love your wife better that week, uh, women, you respecting your husbands uh, to the glory of God better the next following week. Broken hearts healed, contrite spirits restored. Oh, brothers and sisters, that we may see clearly the amazing work of the triune, what the triune God is doing through the power of the Holy Spirit to preach the gospel effectively. So, Christ commands uh, his w- Christ commands his disciples that they will be witnesses. So another question I have is what does it mean to be a witness? A witness is someone who is able to give evidence or facts about an event or a person. Um, And so what are we giving facts or evidence for? Well, the gospel. And so we must ask the question, Simply, what is the gospel? And there's a whole way, um, a whole array of how you can go about it, right? Um, and this is just the way I'm, I'm doing it tonight. Uh, God sent his son who put on sinful flesh and have never sinned. So man, God became man, incarnation, conceived through the virgin birth by Mary, 
and lived a perfect holy life before God, obeying all of God's commands, FYA, a life we can never live, even on our best day. Jesus was crucified, taking the wrath of God for our sin and shame, rebellion toward God, thus making atonement for God's people. Christ was buried, resurrected, uh, as to say he is justified, or, or he has justified us in the resurrection, meaning we have right standing before God. And he ascended and is... Uh, he ascended and is seated at the right hand of God the Father until the time the Father has fixed for Christ to consummate the final salvation. The gospel is the proclamation that the apostles took to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. The same gospel that the apostles took to those three locations continued to spread for thousands of years, and this is why both you and I are saved is because God saw it fit through the power of the Holy Spirit for the gospel message to be preached to the ends of the earth. Um, so as Christ commands the, uh, the disciples to go and preach to Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth, happens to be um, a theme within this small section throughout the whole entire book of Acts. So when Christ commands them to go to Jerusalem, we can read that in chapters 1 through 7. When he commands the disciples to go to Judea and Samaria, we can read that through uh, chapters 8 to 12. And then the command to go to the ends of the earth, with, which is where we see a lot of Paul's missionary journeys, is chapters 13 to 28. So, again, where are we going? We are going to preach the gospel through the power of the Holy Spirit effectively for the sake of building up Christ's church. In Ephesians chapter 4, uh, verse 11, he gave apostles and prophets and evangelists and shepherds and teachers to equip the saints for the work of the ministry for the building up of the body of Christ. So that is where, brothers and sisters, where we are going. We're going to preach the gospel. We're going to equip the saints for the work of the ministry to go and preach the gospel effectively. But that has to be done by faith in Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit. Okay, so to answer the question in part, where are we going? We're going to preach the gospel effectively through the power of the Holy Spirit. In the towns we live, visit, or even may move to. All right, now verse 9. And when he had said these things, they were looking on. He was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. Um, so, when when we see the word cloud, that in a sentence in the Bible, we uh, commonly understand it to be the manifestation of God's presence. God has m manifested his presence. Um, and so, Jesus being lifted up teaches us a couple things. Uh, one, that the apostles foolishly yearned to bring Jesus back into the comfort of the second coming. So um, the two men in verse, no, no, and when, I'm sorry, go verse 9. And when he said these things they were looking on, he was lifted up, and the cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven, he went, and behold, the two men stood with him in white robes. And said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way that you saw him go. So this cloud fully engulfed Christ so that the disciples could no longer see him. Because the disciples uh, foolishly wanted Christ not to leave. They didn't want him to, to ascend. They wanted him, 
here on earth. There is some debate among uh, commentators uh, for, the, uh, for the two men correcting. Uh, some say correcting, some say softly rebuking, some say I would call a, a swift rebuke. Some commentators say that the swift rebuke is to the disciples' laziness because Christ has commanded them to go and be his witnesses in all Judea, Jerusalem, Samaria, and to the end of the sage. Another commentator says um, that it's just, hey, you, you guys are being selfish here, and you need to let Christ do what the Father has intended to, um, and you need to let him go. And for, um, in John, uh, the Apostle John says that, uh, records Jesus saying that I have to go and I'm going to leave a helper with you, which is the Holy Spirit. And so Christ ascends. We need to understand, oh, okay. In a, cloud of, in, the, in a cloud of glory teaches us that Jesus retains his physical body in heaven. Also, when Christ returns, he will return in his physical body. Jesus will remain fully God and fully man for all eternity. So when Christ returns, he's going to return the same way he left, in his full physical body. And that and so as we took communion this earlier this Lord's day this morning, we were reminded that we're going to be able to do this again with Christ. And we're going to be able to know Christ, we're going to see his physical body, his body is not just going to be Christ in his total divinity without his body, but it's going to be both because he's fully God and he's fully man. Matthew 28, 18, and Jesus says, uh, I have all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me, uh, and which is demonstrating that Christ, that Christ has executive authority in God's spiritual kingdom. He is the one who rules and reigns. He is the one who judges. Um, a, quote, a couple quotes from church history. Justice Jonas, which is the contempor- uh, kind of a contemporary of Martin Luther, but he was more on like the back end of Luther's life said this about the ascension. Nothing is more effective for consoling afflicted consciences than the ascension. The account of Christ is of absolutely no benefit to you unless you know Christ's accomplishments. That is, his death, resurrection, ascension. He died for our sins. He rose again for our justification when he ascended, he took captive captivity, that is, sin, death, hell, and the kingdom of the devil. Luther, Martin Luther, has said, There sits my Lord, who ascended there, and I too will ascend there. He doesn't need me, but accomplished it for my benefit. Their promised return of Christ does a couple of things. So where, where am I getting that? The last verse, um, this Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. So Jesus ascends in a cloud and he will descend on his, descend in his return on, in a cloud. Does a couple of things. One, it removes sorrow in that by faith we patiently wait for Christ's return. And by waiting, the waiting is not just laying around, hanging out, checking the box you prayed, read your Bible for Jesus to return. Oh, waiting for the Christ to return is obeying the command right here in verse 8. And you will be my witnesses in all of Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria to the end of the earth. Christ will redeem his bride in his second coming. 
The result of waiting for Christ's return must restrain the desires of our flesh and help us in our patience in adversity and, ref and refresh our weariness for the life of the believer. So that when um, the enemy comes and we're tempted, when that coworker comes and he gets under our skin, just call it what it is. The ascension gives us patience. It helps us. It comforts us. Let us not be like the disciples in that as they're waiting for Christ to come back after he ascends in the sense of Christ never re reaching the right hand of the Father. But let us be um, waiting patiently for Christ to return when the Father has fixed the proper time for him to descend and to return. And let the ascension uh, restore, uh, restore us while we wait. Third, uh, the promised return of Christ causes fear in the unbeliever. So if you're not in Christ, if you don't have the Holy Spirit, you should be absolutely terrified. And I don't say that to scare you or trick you. But I say that because it's what the Bible says, right? We read the book of Revelation. Christ is going to return on a white horse, uh, the sword coming out of his mouth, and he's going to jub, judge both uh, the Christian and the unbeliever, the world. And so, uh, so this causes fear in uh, unbelievers because they will see Christ return on his throne of judgment when he, Christ judged the world. Right? So it's going to be a beautiful, wonderful thing when Christ descends um, and redeems his bride, but it's also going to be a terrifying thing if you're not in Christ. So, wrapping things up. Conclusion, application, so what? So I titled the end of this thing, all the three of those things. In Acts chapter 1, 6 through 11, we asked and answered the question, where are we going? First, uh, we are going to effectively preach the gospel through the power of the Holy Spirit by faith in the towns we live, visit, or even may move to. Secondly, by faith, we will wait patiently for Christ's return to redeem us, to take us home for all eternity. I just want to add this real quick. If Christ is returning in his physical body, we're going to have the same physical body in heaven. So if you're thinking getting Arnold Schwarzenegger's body, you're not getting it. <laughs> the body you have here on earth is the body you'll have here in heaven thirdly thirdly maybe you're sitting there thinking what if I don't have the Holy Spirit I've come to worship services for the last couple years now right you, you hear the effective preaching of the gospel and yet you wonder how am I not saved yet? Why, why do I not have the Holy Spirit? What if I'm not a part of a local church? What if I don't have a pastor? Right? In Scripture it says that a pastor will give an account for his sheep. And if you are truly a sheep, you have a shepherd to love and care for you. If you don't have that, and Christ returns, then what becomes of you? Right? Will Christ redeem me? Maybe you're thinking. Only if you come to him on his terms. And this is the terms that Pastor John has reminded us faithfully every Sunday morning. Repent, believe the gospel, and be baptized. Those are the terms by which the Lord Jesus Christ commends all men and women to himself. That will conclude our time this evening. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for the opportunity to come and preach your word. God, will you 
Use your word to transform our hearts and our lives. Um, God, thank you for the, the triune passage that you have given us in the Acts. God, will you uh, use the reality of the ascension of the Lord Jesus Christ to heal our sorrows? Um, God, thank you for sending Jesus to, who made atonement for us and justified us so that we would stand, stand in right position before you for all eternity. It truly is a gift of grace and not of our own doing. To you be the glory forever and ever. Amen.